Previously on Bad Cops. FBI agent Erica Jensen is months into an investigation of the Gun Trace Task Force, a unit of the Baltimore Police Department that she now believes is corrupt to the core. But the warning signs have been there for some time. Years earlier, Gary Brown was stopped in his car by a couple of cops, and $11,000 disappeared from his trunk. I was robbed by Baltimore City Police. So he made a complaint. Banged on the door. The police took my money. And later, one of the cops who stopped him is asked to join an elite plainclothes unit, the Gun Trace Task Force. Over the years, similar complaints are made about the other officers from the squad, but none of them stick. And money's not the only thing going missing when these officers are on duty. There's another major player in the crimes of the Gun Trace Task Force. He's not a cop, but he's more tangled up in this conspiracy than anyone realizes. I'd already been into the drug game for, you know, the majority of my life. I was more of a cocaine dealer, and that was my expertise. He's going to take us down a rabbit hole, deep into the double life of Sergeant Wayne Jenkins. I'm Jessica Lussenhop, and this is Bad Cops from the BBC World Service, the true story of Baltimore's Gun Trace Task Force. Part 4. The Man Behind the Curtain. Test one, two, one, two. Test, test, test. I'm sitting in an office building just outside of Baltimore, across from a man I've been trying for ages to get to talk to me. I feel like this has kind of been a long time coming. I feel like we've been talking about doing this for what, like three years? Yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been quite a while. It's been a, it's been a journey, though. You, you have no idea what uh, the legal steps that me and my attorneys have had to take uh, coming through all this. So good thing for my friend Marshall Hensley here that... Uh, he decided to keep fighting with me all the way through, and that's why we're sitting here today in this office. Tell me your name and introduce yourself however you'd like to. I'm Donnie Stepp, just an interesting guy that uh, unfortunately found myself in a, a pretty bad situation. Donnie Stepp is 55 years old. He's got this perfectly bald head and a short, light-colored beard. He's wearing a huge gold cross on a chain and a T-shirt that says, Believe. His lawyer is sitting to my right, listening in, making sure his client doesn't say anything that could get him into trouble. Well, more trouble, anyway. Donnie Stepp got out of prison six months ago. When we meet, he's on a strict schedule. He's wearing an ankle monitor, and he's got to get back home by midday, or he'll break the conditions of his house arrest. Is it annoying? Like, can you take it off uh, ever? No, you know, I wouldn't suggest it. I have a feeling that um, we could end up back in front of the court. So you have to sleep, shower, everywhere. It, it comes with you. It's better than sitting inside of a federal uh, penal institution. So I'll take the I'll take the ankle bracelet. <laughs> Donnie Stepp's been in and out of prison since he was a kid, mainly for drugs. And his most recent conviction was for his role in a drug conspiracy possession with intent to distribute crack, heroin, cocaine, MDMA, and other controlled substances. When I ask him why he did it, he doesn't hesitate. Greed. When I testified about greed, it was the truth, and none of it was worth it now looking back. I just didn't realize how much damage, and for that I'm extremely remorseful, and and I'm sorry, and um, that's a part of the story that I hope that you also convey is just how how sorry I truly am. This particular chapter in Steph's life begins around 2011 when he gets an invite to an underground card game. And he just can't say no to a game of cards. I've been alleged to have a gambling problem. <laughs> As my attorney rolls his eyes, <laughs> he would say allegations. But <laughs> anyway... Pretty much all of what Donnie Stepp's about to tell me is what he told the FBI and a jury. 
I can't independently verify everything he says, but at this card game, we know that a bunch of the regular players were Baltimore City cops who just couldn't help bragging about their exploits on the streets. I got to hear the, the stories and the different things that were going on in the city, and we would gamble and play cards. So that was, uh, was just a unique insight, I guess, into the mindset of the police department and the operational things that were going on. I would hear about that. These unbelievable stories that are true. Step loved to hear about these high-profile arrests and drug busts. One of the loudest storytellers and a regular fixture at these games was Wayne Jenkins, the future leader of the Gun Trace Task Force, the unit leading the city's fight against illegal weapons. Donnie Stepp had gone to school with members of the Jenkins family. He'd known them for decades. Wayne was, uh, was the little brother of, of a friend that I went to school with, a friend that I'd known, and we'd run around together and everything. So they were well known within our neck of the woods. But around the time they were playing cards together, Step hadn't seen Jenkins for years. Donnie Step had been trying to straighten out his life. He got married and had a daughter. He worked in real estate and then started up his own bail bond company, Double D Bail Bonds. But things started to slip. At the time of the card games, he was addicted to gambling. And he'd also started dealing drugs. And this wasn't small time. Step says he was dealing directly with Colombian and Dominican cartels. I was already inside the underground in the world, so I had my own connections. I could get anything that I needed delivered. As Wayne Jenkins and Step get closer, the cop can tell that his new buddy isn't exactly on the straight and narrow. And Jenkins senses an opportunity. One night, they head out to a casino. That was where the conspiracy come together as we were driving. He, uh, he was feeling me out. I knew that's what he was doing. He asked me if I knew people that could take the drugs. You know, basically, like, if you can do it, you got people that can take this, we can make some money. And I said, yeah. I said, I, I know a few people. So that was how the conspiracy was originated. At this point in his career, Wayne Jenkins is known as a hard-charging cop with a reputation for getting drugs off the streets. But he's now entered into a criminal partnership with a major Baltimore drug dealer. Because as a cop doing regular drug busts, Jenkins has access to all kinds of narcotics. And he's offering to be Donnie Stepp's supplier. He knew that I had the connection, so I was perfect for him. You know, he didn't realize that he was sitting next to probably one of the biggest dealers in, in Baltimore County, which at the time I was doing rather swell, but I didn't let people know that. I was never one that let people know what I was truly doing in behind the scenes. For every atom bomb, it takes plutonium, and it takes, you know, it, it, takes, uh, it, it takes the right elements to make it. And uh, unfortunately, I was a part of those elements. Almost as soon as Step agrees, Wayne Jenkins starts showing up at his house at all hours. He has his own key to a storage shed behind Step's house, and he's dropping off all kinds of stuff. As well as cocaine, there's heroin, crack, MDMA, and marijuana. I never really dealt marijuana. I was more of a cocaine dealer, and that was my expertise. Step scrambles to find new customers for all these drugs that Jenkins is bringing him. And pretty soon, it's just overwhelming. I mean, I couldn't keep up with him. It was just an abundance of narcotics. Street rips, this, that, things that weren't making it to the evidence room. I was just shocked. And then he was bringing drugs that just wasn't my cup of tea. I don't deal heroin. I don't like it. It's not my thing. But he would have such an abundance of that that he ended up storing at my place that would just accumulate over years that was just staggering. I had chests and safes that were just full of marijuana. The whole house was, I was like, oh my God, I gotta, <laughs> I can't take no more. You know what I mean? It's like, even with my connections, I can't move the weight of what he's bringing to me. I just can't do it. The shed keeps filling up 
and Donnie Stepp starts stashing drugs all over his house. Even though he can't keep up with the supply, Wayne Jenkins is giving him drugs for pennies on the dollar. For a kilo of cocaine, Stepp would pay his usual suppliers almost $40,000. But with Jenkins, it was just 15000 I could outdo anybody on the streets with any price. I was business 101. Some people would look at me like, how can you do this? And like, you know, you don't need to know. Wayne Jenkins is supplying his friend with so many narcotics that Stepp's old Dominican and Colombian connections start wondering why he's not coming around anymore which is its own potentially dangerous problem. Don't get me wrong. You cross them, they'll kill you. It's just that simple. It'd be like, is everything all right? <laughs> I mean, like, what's going on? Are you going somewhere else? <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's like, I can't tell them, you know, like, hey, I got a new supply now coming from the police department. <laughs> and, and, you know, I can't say that. Wayne, at one point in time, uh, uh, said to me at the house, you, you know, you could actually have more, more drugs and narcotics here than the evidence room in Baltimore City Police Department. If Jenkins came across a really big score, he'd call his friend ahead of time to tell him to be ready. I always knew it was something big if he would call me on either the burner phone that he had or contact me. And if it was late, tell me to open the garage door, I, I knew that it was something substantial coming. Wayne Jenkins even starts bringing his friend down to Baltimore Police Department headquarters. He tells him, don't worry about it. The other police officers will just assume you're a federal agent. Walking through the police department with you know, stolen drugs, and you know, I'd be walking by dozens and dozens of officers and getting on the same elevators and stuff with them, parked in the SWAT parking lot. And I'm like, okay, I'm coming out with the next shipment from you guys, and uh, you're waving at me. You were there actually picking up stuff. Many times, I'd be parking inside of headquarters and picking up a shipment. One time. Jenkins brings Step to his Baltimore Police Department office on a quick errand. The funny thing about that was I was, I was late for dinner, and my phone was uh, blowing up from my significant other. And, you know, where are you? So he said to me, he goes, here, put this on real quick and tell her that you're working undercover with me. Jenkins hands Step a police tactical vest and a gun belt, and he starts taking pictures. I've seen these photos. They're pretty crazy. In one of them, Stepp's got his hand on the holster of the gun. In another, he's crouched in a shooter's position, pointing the gun. We're laughing. We're laughing so hard inside of there. And, and I go ahead and put this on, and we send the text. her saying, look, I'm busy right now. I can't make it. So it was nothing but us joking around. That's the story behind that. Working this way, it made Donnie Stepp feel like Jenkins was untouchable that he and his gun trace task force basically ran the city. It was all reward and no risk. I've long thought of Donnie's step as kind of this man behind the curtain. Because of their drug dealing partnership, Step had a front row seat to the double life that Jenkins was leading. And he saw just how blatant he could be when breaking the law. In April 2015, a young black man named Freddie Gray died in police custody. It was a seismic moment in Baltimore's history. His death sparked protests throughout the city and once again put a spotlight on police brutality in the U.S. The day of Gray's funeral, violence and looting broke out. With the police under attack, Sergeant Wayne Jenkins went into superhero mode. He commandeered a van to rescue officers. The department later gave him a bronze star for bravery. But Donnie Stepp has very different memories of Jenkins from that day. He says that during some of the worst violence, Jenkins showed up with two garbage bags filled with prescription drugs. And he says Jenkins had stolen these drugs directly from people who were looting pharmacies during the unrest. That's his MO. That's where he's at. That's what he does. Basically, he was out on the streets. And he just didn't walk into the pharmacy himself, I don't believe, but who knows? Anything I know is that he had them. This was one of those nights when Jenkins called Step to tell him he's got something really special. He told me to open the garage door, and he had two large bags just loaded. And you know, I'm just like, what is it? Stuff that's been stolen from the pharmacies. There was so much drugs in one of the bags that it had tore 
and it, it spilled out. And it really got me nervous because I have animals and stuff. It was just too much, over the top. Drugs, I didn't even know what drugs were. I mean, it was just, you know, here you are, he's delivering pharmacies to you. I mean, I mean, there's not too many people that can do that, but he could. Jenkins and Step sat together Googling the stamps and the numbers on all the stolen pills, trying to figure out what they actually had. Most of it turns out to be worthless. Except for the Viagra. That sold well. But Step knew that what really got Jenkins going were his monsters. I've got a monster. It was one of his slang terms for a major narcotics dealer. So when he would say them words, we all knew what that meant. And to us, it wasn't a nickel-dime show or something like that. that It could potentially be millions. So those were the words, believe it or not, when you're involved in the illegal stuff that you do want to hear because you realize that this could be a a significant score. In Jenkins' mind, the term monster described O. Reese Stevenson perfectly. Stevenson was the guy the task force cops arrested with a load of cocaine and cash in the back of his minivan. And Jenkins was convinced he had a whole lot more back home. So that's where he and his officers headed next. Hey, Sarge. Hey, come downstairs right quick. They're about to get it open. In Stevenson's basement, they filmed themselves breaking into his safe full of cash after tossing $100,000 in a bag for themselves. But that's not all Sergeant Jenkins was up to. At some point, between arresting Stevenson and busting open his safe, Jenkins called his friend Donnie Stepp and said those four magic words. I've got a monster. Jenkins gives him Stevenson's address. He tells him to hurry. There are 10 kilos of cocaine and stacks of cash in the house. He wants his friend to get to the house before they do and take the drugs and money. In other words, rob the place. He wants me to come and extract the uh, money and drugs that he's claiming is there. Um, But you got to understand, you got to understand, oftentimes he would exaggerate. He's a live wire and extremely dangerous individual. He claims that he's got a monster. So he wanted me to come to this address, kick in the back door. Nobody's there. You know, it's all simple stuff. He'll hang back. There's nothing to worry about. Selling hundreds of thousands of dollars in stolen drugs is one thing. But home invasions and burglaries, that's not really Donnie Stepp's line of work. And his friend Sergeant Jenkins' crazy risk-taking is starting to make him nervous. When you know that you're dealing with a person who's elevators not clicking on all floors you know you got to proceed with caution so you know i was torn it was a paradox in both ways he's telling me it's simple just kick the door in and extract it there's 10 kilograms of cocaine here as soon as you come through the door altogether it's around 1.75 million dollars in drugs and, and cash step is not a fan of this plan but he can't keep himself from thinking about all that money 1.75 1.75 has me interested. You know, I'd be lying if I told you I wasn't interested for 1.75 million. He jumps in his car and speeds over to O'Ree Stevenson's house. But when he gets there, he sees somebody at the back door. It's a young boy. It totally spooks him. He's scared that the house could be full of people. So he drives two blocks further up and watches through a pair of binoculars. He sees the Gun Trace Task Force arrive, with Jenkins directing the whole show. He watches as they enter the house. Eventually, he spots Jenkins leaving, alone. He looked like Santa Claus. His vest is protruded as I figured he had all the drugs and all the money on him. I was like, wow, that is impressive to be able to get that much inside of a police vest. He heads to the back of the unmarked car. He pops the trunk. I see him throw the bag in. He gets on the phone. He doesn't realize where I'm sitting. I'm looking right at him. He says, where are you? I'm like, I'm looking at you. He says, don't don't come up close. He says, shoot straight down that road. I shot down the road. He come flying up behind me with the unmarked car. He pops open the passenger side of my vehicle. At that time, bricks of cocaine start flying into my vehicle. He had the money and drugs. The problem was he just didn't have as much as I thought that he did. I'm looking at him, and I'm like, 
where's the rest of them? You know what I mean, too? My math tells me there's eight missing. I was kind of disappointed because I realized that, hey, if he gets all that in here, you know, we're looking at a million dollar street value. These frantic last minute heists are grinding Steps' nerves down. And after five years of this, he's starting to get worried. He's pretty sure their luck is gonna run out soon. And so he starts recording their crimes on his phone. He's not exactly sure what for. He just has this feeling, like he needs some extra insurance. I documented in pictures because there's something inside of me that's telling me it's just not adding up. You know what I mean? He's, he's dangerous, you know what I mean? And I know that. I know he's deceptive. I know he's dangerous. He was pitching many different capers and jobs. I told him, I'm, I'm not into the burglaries. I'm not doing them. I just told him point blank, I'm not doing them. Even though my criminality is not right, but just certain things that I just don't cross over into that I'm just not into. He didn't like that. What's wrong with you? Several million dollars, man. I don't care what's in there. You know what I mean? It's just it's not worth losing my life or someone else losing their life with a crazy like you coming through the door. So, you know, I had to look at the paradox in, in many different ways. So I just told him no, and I, I stopped going with him. Like, you know, you don't need me. Do your own gig. I know how heavily involved that I've been for years and I've been the go-to guy to sell millions of dollars in drugs for him. I knew that this is trouble and knew it. Again, as with the rest of Donnie Stepp's story, I have no way to independently check every detail. But it's the same account he gave the FBI and a jury. Sometime in the winter of 2017, they go to a party together. Stepp is watching Jenkins like a hawk. He gets out his phone and starts secretly filming him on the dance floor. As he's watching him, Step no longer sees Jenkins as this untouchable super cop. And he realizes that he needs to bring this friendship, albeit a very lucrative one, to an end. I could see that something was wrong with him. So I knew that there had to be an end game. He was just too eccentric, too volatile, too dangerous. I mean, it's just that simple. I could see it after I got further into the conspiracy where I had to get away from him. I knew it. But it's already too late. And all of a sudden I get a phone call and my heart just went boom. That's next time. You've been listening to Bad Cops from the BBC World Service with me, Jessica Lessenhop. The program was mixed by Neil Churchill, additional mixing by James Beard. The producer is Ben Crichton, and the editor is Richard Varden.